Alrighty, so this is the first episode of our new series, Let Me Explain. I'm Paul. I'm Dave. And Justin. Sorry, I had to stretch. <laughs> and yawn. It was, it was, I don't know. Anyway, so this week, I'm up first with my report. I'm doing a, we'll see how long it takes, uh, report on the Somerton Man. Okay. Okay, well, it's something I know absolutely nothing about, so this Did is good. Go. Okay, interesting. Fascinating. Okay, so what I'm going to need both of you to do is to cast your minds back in time and to a different continent. How far and Where? how far away continent-wise? Southern Australia. Okay. More specifically, uh, just outside of Adelaide. Not sure where that is, but okay, somewhere in South Africa. I South Australia. Australia. Australia, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're off to a bloody good start. So this story Crikey starts me. on December 1st, 1948, at 6.30am. Okay. Okay. On that date, at that time, the police are contacted about the body of a man discovered on Somerton Beach, about 11 kilometers southwest of Adelaide, South Australia. The man was found lying in the sand across from the crippled children's home, which was, uh, he was lying on his back with his head resting against the seawall. His legs were extended and his feet were crossed. It was believed he had died while sleeping. An unlit cigarette was in the right collar of his coat. The ser- a search of the man's pockets revealed he had a unused second class uh, train ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, a bus ticket from the city that would have uh, that could not be proved to have been used. Uh, a narrow aluminum American comb, a half-empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, an army club cigarette packet containing seven cigarettes, and a quarter full box of matches. Okay. Yeah, it was totally going to survive there. It's Australia. It's not like it gets cold. No, but, I mean, I don't know. Nocturnal animals. Did he have any money on him? Uh, he did not have a wallet on him. Okay, mm. well that doesn't help much. Witnesses came forward, uh, who came forward said that on the evening of November 30th, they had seen an individual resembling the dead man lying on his back in the same spot and position near the crippled children's home, where the corpse was later found. A couple saw him around 7 p.m. and noted that he had extended uh, his right arm to the fullest extent and then dropped it limply. Another couple saw him from 7.30 to 8 p.m., during which time the street lights had come on, recounted that they not, did not see him move during the half an hour in which he was in view, although they did have the impression that his position had changed. Although they commented between themselves that he must be dead because he was not reacting to the mosquitoes, they thought it more likely that he was drunk or asleep, and thus did not investigate further. Yeah. One of the witnesses told the police that she observed the man looking down at the sleeping man from on top of the steps that led to the beach. Witnesses said the body was in the same position when the police viewed it. Yeah. Another witness came forward in 1959 and reported to the police that he and three others had seen a well-dressed man carrying another man on his shoulders along Somerton Beach the night before the body was found. Yeah. All right. So first I'm going to show you a picture of the dead man. So that is who we refer to as the Somerton Man. Okay. Okay. Okay, sure. And I'm going to show you a picture of the area he was found in. And X marks the approximate location of the body. I apologize, the image is kind of small. Oh, yeah. Oh, It's a little black X. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, continuing on. Uh, According to the pathologist, uh, the man was of British appearance and thought to be about 40 to 45 years old, was in top physical condition. He was about 5'11", with hazel eyes, uh, fair to ginger-colored hair, slightly gray around the temples, Mm -hmm. with broad shoulders and a narrow waist, hands and nails that showed no signs of manual labor, and uh, his big and little toes met in a wedge like those of a dancer or who someone who wore boots with pointed toes. Uh-huh. Okay, then. He had pronounced high calf muscles like those of a ballet dancer. 
Those can be a uh, dominant genetic trait, uh, the toes, and they also a characteristic of many middle and long distance runners. Mm. He was dressed in a white shirt, red and blue tie, brown trousers, socks and shoes, and a brown knitted pullover and fashionable gray and brown double breasted jacket. Mm. All labels on his clothes had been removed. Mm. Carried no identification, no wallet. Uh, which led the police to believe he committed suicide. Hmm. However, his teeth did not match any of the dental records of any known living person. The coroner remarked that if the body had been carried to his final resting place, then all of the difficulties would disappear. They'd be able to tell he'd been moved. Hmm. They couldn't tell that. An autopsy was conducted, and the, and the pathologist estimated the time of death to be around 1 a.m. on the 1st of December. Hmm. Here's a little bit more about the autopsy. The heart was of normal size and normal in every way. Okay? Small uh, vessels that are not commonly observed in the brain were easily discernible with congestion, and all, basically all of his organs had some type of congestion in them. Hmm. They were slightly enlarged. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the autopsy showed that the man's last meal was a pasty eaten three to four hours before death. Uh... Tests failed to reveal any foreign substance in the body. Uh, and quoting the pathologist, Dr. Dwyer, I am quite convinced that the death could have been natural. The poison I suggested was a barbiturate or a soluble hypnotic. Although poisoning remained as a prime suspicion, the pasty was not believed to be the source of the poison. Other than that, the coroner was unable to reach a conclusion as to the man's identity, cause of death, or, or whether the man seen alive at Somerton Beach on the evening of November 30th was the same man, as nobody had seen his face at the time. Mm. The body was embalmed on December 10th, 1948, after the police were unable to get a positive identification. So, any theories yet? Because we're just getting started. It's going to get stranger. Okay. Well, I mean, we're only at the top of the rabbit hole. We haven't really jumped right in yet. Oh, yeah, we're only going into page three of nine. Mm. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Ideas, then. So think, no no theories yet? I think the only one thing is through... There was just the autopsy. It wasn't any sort of other physical exam that they did on the body. Uh, there was just the autopsy, to my knowledge. Okay. Mm because the only thought I had was... No, even then, there was no mention of any other sort of poison going through the system. No, and there was no, like, bruising or anything on his body. Hmm. So he must have died somehow. No. Well, clearly he's dead. Suffocation or something? There was maybe? no marks of any asphyxiation, uh, no bruising. Nothing that's caused his nope. throat to be enlarged. Didn't drown or... Nope. There's no water found in his lungs. The only thing that was odd was all of his organs were slightly enlarged. Was there any sort of specific reason why that happened? It, not that I know of. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So, a suitcase was found at the Adelaide train station on January 14th, 1949. They discovered a brown suitcase with its label removed, which had been checked into the station cloakroom sometime after 11 a.m. on the 30th of November, 1948. It was believed that the suitcase was owned by the man found on the beach. Uh, in the suitcase were a number of articles of clothing, most of which had their labels removed. Nah. No, oh, that matches. They did, however, find... Ah, uh, yes, they found the name T. Keen on a tie, Keen on the laundry bag, and Keen on a, like, tank top. Okay. Otherwise, all labels are removed from all of the clothing. Some of the clothing used a type of thread that was not available in Australia at the time. So obviously he was foreign. That is the theory so far. Or at least wore foreign clothing. Yes. Uh, it was noted that uh, the keen tanks were the only ones that could not have been removed without damaging the clothing. Mm. That was unusual as there was no spare socks found in the suitcase and no correspondence, despite the fact that uh, police found pencils and unused letter forms. Okay. A search concluded that there was no T. Keen missing in any English-speaking country. Mm. 
and a nationwide circulation of the dry cleaning marks that they found on the clothes that gave dates as to when they were last dry cleaned uh, proved fruitless. So there's nobody by that name missing in any English-speaking country that they know of, mm-hmm. and the dry cleaning marks don't turn up anything. Uh-huh. Uh, in fact, all that could be garnered from the suitcase uh, was that since a coat in the suitcase had um, a type of stitching that was only used in the U.S., okay, uh, the coat could not have been imported, indicating that the man had been in the United States or brought the coat from someone of a familiar size who had been there. Mm. Uh, police checked incoming train records and believed the man arrived at the Adelaide train station uh, by an overnight train from either Melbourne, Sydney, or Port Augusta. They speculated he showed and shaved at the adja- adjacent city baths uh, before returning to the plane to plane station train station to purchase a ticket for the 1050 train to Henley Beach, hmm. which he never caught. Okay, so now we go to the coroner's inquest. A coroner's inquest into the death conducted by coroner Thomas Erdskine Cleland. I'm probably butchering that name, but... Commenced a few days after the body was found, but was uh, adjourned on the 17th of June, 1949. The investigating uh, pathologist re-examined the body and made a number of discoveries. Uh, He noted that the man's shoes were were remarkably clean, and appeared to have been recently polished, which obviously wouldn't make sense if he'd been walking along the beach. Mm. Mm. Uh, he noticed he added all uh, his evidence and fitted into the theory that the body might have been brought to Somerton Beach after the man's death, accounting for the lack of evidence of vomiting and convulsions, which are the two main effects of poison. Mm. He speculated that some of the witnesses could positively identify the man they saw that night as being... I speculated that as none of the witnesses could positively identify the man uh, as being the same person that identified, there was a a possibility that he had died elsewhere and been dumped. He he stressed that this is purely speculation as all the witnesses believed that it was definitely the same person. As the body was in the same place, laying in the same distinctive position, and uh, he also found there was no evidence of who the man was. The shoes strike me as kind of a... I don't know. Why would they be polished, and could it be of any relation? Interesting. Mm. So, uh, after the inquest, a plaster cast was made of the man's head and shoulders. Now we get to arguably the most interesting part. Okay. Hmm. A scrap of paper in a distinctive font was found hidden in the dead man's trousers, torn from the last page of a rare New Zealand edition of, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this because I believe it's Arabic and I don't speak Arabic. It's Arabic or Persian or I don't know what language it is. Uh, it is called the Rubaiyat of Omar Kayam. I'm probably butchering that. Around this, uh, basically what it is is it's um, a book of... Um, Poetry. Oh, yeah. Around the same time as the inquest, uh, yeah, this torn piece of paper, which I have a photo for you to take a look at, bore two words. Tom and should. Or Tom and should. And I will let you see the photo. Tom and should. Hmm. Okay. 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 So that translates in its native language to finished... Or ended. Oh, yeah. It is found on the last page of the book I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. and on the other side, there was no writing, it was blank. Mm-hmm. Uh, police conducted an Australia wide search to find a copy of the book that had a the missing piece. Okay. Mm, uh, following a public appeal by the police, the copy of the book uh, from which the page had been torn was located. A man showed the police a 1941 edition. Of the translation of this book published in New Zealand, the the person who gave them this book, their name was never released. It was held in confidence by the police. Okay. It was referred to by the pseudonym Ronald Francis, but had never been officially identified. Mm. Francis had not considered that the book might have been connected to the case until he saw an article in the newspaper. Huh? On the inside of the back cover, detectives found indentations from handwriting. These included a telephone number an unidentified number, and text that resembled an encrypted message. Mm. 
According to statements made by police, the book was found at the, in the rear footwell of a car about the same time as the body of the unidentified man had been found. There was some, there was some uncertainty about the cir circumstances in which the book was found. One newspaper article refers to the book being found about a week or two before the body was found, but uh, former uh, South Australian police detective reports that the book was found just after the man was found on the beach at Somerton. The timing is significant as the man is presumed, based on the suitcase, to have arrived in Adelaide the day before he was found on the beach. Hmm. If the book was there one or two weeks before, it suggests that he had either been there previously or had been in Adelaide for longer than assumed. Hmm. The theme of the book is that one should live life to the fullest and have no regrets when it ends. The poem subjects, the poem subjects, led police to theorize that the man had committed suicide by poison, although there is no other evidence to back up this theory. Uh, the book was missing the piece of paper I showed you. Hmm. On the last page, uh, microscopic tests were done to prove that that piece of paper came from that book. Okay. So it's hmm. not a coincidence. Those two are connected. Hmm. Okay. The handwriting found at the back of the book is to, presumed to be some type of code. And I'm going to give you a look at this as well. Which, again, I apologize because it isn't terribly large, but you can give it a squiz. Uh, boy. It's a bunch of just random numbers and letters. And complete gibberish from what I can presume, but it's probably not. Unless you're good at those particular word puzzles that jamble the words. Okay. Well, we're going to get to that. Don't even know what language it's going to try and... I don't know. In the back of the book were faint indentations, which were what I showed you. That's mm -hmm. then, you know, my look at it. Mm -hmm. Representing five lines of text in capital letters. In capital letters. The second line had been struck out, a fact that is considered significant due to the similarities to the fourth line, and is potentially representing an error in the message. Mm. So, like, he was writing it out, fucked something up, crossed it out, and rewrote part of it. Not him. At this point, do you have any theories? Well, I can't exactly decode the message too well from just taking a glance at it. Well, no, fair enough. But do you have any theories as about who the man might have been? Uh, no idea. No idea. Dave, do you have anything? Nothing too specific. Again, with the couple things that they sort of run through with the description of the man, there are lots of points to go on, but there's nothing concrete about it. The best that you can sort of make of it is he was some sort of dancer that decided to go supposedly go on vacation and something supposedly happened or he had a plan within his mind and it succeeded supposedly. Okay. We still have a little bit more to go. No, I'm not too surprised. I'm uh -huh. thinking we're somewhere on six. Uh, we're just starting seven. Ah, okay. Okay, we're getting there. An unlisted telephone number was also found in the back of the book. Belonging to, uh, belonging to a nurse named Jessica Ellen Thompson. Okay. Uh, born Jessie Harkness in the Sydney suburb, in a Sydney suburb, she moved to this area and lived about 400 meters or 1,300 feet north of the location where the body was found. Okay. So very close by. Okay. Hmm. When she was interviewed by police, Thompson said that she did not know the dead man. She said that she did not know why the dead man would have her phone number and chose to visit her suburb on the night of his death. However, she reported that sometime in late 1948, an unidentified man had attempted to visit her and asked a next-door neighbor about her. In his book on the case, uh, Jerry felt it stated that when he interviewed Thompson in 2002, he found that she was either being evasive or just did not wish to talk about it. He believed that Thompson knew the Somerton man's identity, uh, her daughter, Kate, in a television interview in 2014, said that she believed her mother knew the dead man. Mm. In 1949, Jessica Thompson requested that the police not keep a permanent record of her name or release her details to third parties, as it, was, as it would be embarrassing and harmful to her reputation to be linked to such a case. Mm. The police mm. agreed, a decision that hampered later investigations. Because obviously, she's potentially an important witness, and they're not keeping her details. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Thompson was frequently referred to by various pseudonyms, including the nickname Jetson. Jetson, sorry. 
Uh, names such as Teresa Johnson. Gary felt his claim that he was given permission by Thompson's families to disclose her names and that of her husband, Prosper Thompson. Nevertheless, the names Felton used in his book were pseudonyms. Uh, Feltis also stated that her family did not know of her connection to the case uh, and that he agreed not to disclose her identity, identity or anything that might reveal it. Her real name is considered to be important as it is a possibility as the possibility exists that it may be the decryption key for the purported code. Hmm. When she was shown the plaster cast of the dead man by the detective working the case, she said that she could not identify the person detected. However, according to the detective, he described her reaction of seeing the cast as being completely taken aback to the point of giving the appearance she is about to faint. Hmm. In an interview many years later, the technician who made the cast and was president when she when Thompson viewed it noted that after looking at the bust, she immediately looked away and would not look at it again. Hmm. Thompson hmm. also said that while working at um, a hospital in Sydney during World War II, she had owned a copy of this book. Hmm. Okay. In 1945, at the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney, she had given it to an army lieutenant named, named Alf Boxel, who was serving at the time uh, with the Royal Australian Engineers. Thompson told police that after the war ended, she moved to Melbourne and married. She said that she had received a letter from Boxel and had replied, telling him that she was now married. Uh, subsequent research suggests that her future husband, Prosper Thompson, was now in the process of obtaining a divorce from his first wife in 1949 and did not marry, uh, did not marry Jessica Hardis until about 19 mid-1950. There is no evidence that Boxel had any contact with Hartness after 1945. Hmm. As a result of their conversations with Thompson, police suspected that Boxel was the dead man. However, in 1949, he was found in Sydney, and the final page of his copy of the book, purportedly a 1924 edition published in Sydney, was intact with the two words Tallman should in the book still. Mm-hmm. Boxel was now working in the maintenance section at a bus depot where he had worked prior to the war and was unaware of any link between the dead man and himself. Mm. Now we get to some interesting theories. Okay. So the most persistent theory is that the Somerton man was a spy. Okay. This is mm. due to the circumstances of his death and when he died. So, the, think, the thinking being is he died right not long after the end of World War II. No. Yeah. Right at the beginning of the Cold War. That seemed mm. to be around that, in that era. Mm. Okay. So, this is... Um, one such theory concerns Alf Boxel, who was reportedly involved in intelligence work during and immediately after World War II. In a 1978 television interview, he was asked, uh, you had been working, hadn't you, in, the, in an intelligence unit before you met this young woman, Jessica Hartness. Did you, talk to, did you talk to her about that at all? In reply, Boxel says no. And when asked if Hartness could have known, Boxel replies not unless somebody else told her. When Littlemore, the person doing the interview, suggests in the interview that there may have been an espionage connection to the, uh, the death of uh, the man in Adelaide. Uh, Boxel replies, it's quite a melodramatic thesis, isn't it? Boxel's army service record suggests that he served internally at the Fourth Water uh, Transport Company uh, while being second to the North Australia Observer Unit, a special operations unit, and that his... In his that during his time with the NAOU, Boxel rose rapidly in rank, being promoted from Lance Corporal to Lieutenant within three months. Hmm. Which would be an astronomical raise in rank in such a short time. Hmm. Post-inquest. And we get to the last little bit. Hmm. The burial of the Somerton Man took place on June 14th, 1949. In 1949, the body of the unknown man was buried in Adelaide's West Terrace 
uh, cemetery where the Salvation Army conducted the service. Along those attending were Captain M. Webb of the Salvation Army, Lori Elliott, and a bunch of other people. They're not terribly uh, important. Hmm. Uh, the South Australian Grandstand Bookmakers Association paid for the service to save the man from a pauper's burial. Hmm. The tomb was located at a grave site uh, in the cemetery. The grave contains multiple burials because of an expired lease, with hmm. the Somerton man being the most recent. Hmm. Years after the burial, flowers began appearing on the grave. Police questioned a woman seen leaving the ceremony, but she claimed she knew nothing of the man. About the same time, Ina Harvey, the receptionist at the Strathmore Hotel opposite Adelaide train station, revealed that a strange man stayed in room 21 or 23 for a few days around the same time as the death, checking out on November 30th, 1948. She recalled that he was English-speaking and only carrying a black suitcase, not unlike one a, a musician or a doctor might carry. Hmm. When an employee looked inside the case, he told Harvey that he found an object that he described looking like a needle. On the 22nd of November, 1959, it was reported that an E.B. Collins, an inmate of New Zealand's, of a New Zealand prison, claimed that he knew the identity of the dead man. However, it's never been substantiated. Hmm. There have been numerous unsuccessful attempts in the 60 years since its discovery to crack the letters found at the rear of the book, including efforts by military and naval intelligence, mathematicians, and amateur uh, code crackers. Hmm. In 2004, a retired detective suggested that the final line could stand for the initials of It's, uh, it's Time to Move to South Australia Mosley Street. Uh, the former nurse lived on Mosley Street, which is the main road through the town they were in. Hmm. Uh, a 2014 analysis by a computer, computational linguist uh, strongly supports the theory that the letters consist of the initials of some English text, but finds no match for these in a large survey of literature and concludes that the letters were likely written in some form of shorthand, not as a code, and that the original text uh can likely never be determined. Mm. And finally, the South Australian, Australian Police Historical Society holds the bust, which contains strands of the man's hair. Any further attempts to identify the body have been, uh, have been hampered by the embalming formaldehyde, which had destroyed much of the man's DNA. Other key evidence no longer exists, such as the brown suitcase, which was destroyed in 1986, in addition, witness statements have disappeared from police files over the years. No, oh, well, yeah, over time, the witnesses have probably gone and died now. Yes, yeah. but the files themselves have disappeared. Uh, I see. That happens, I think, with yeah. deterioration and other sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Well, files. and it's also 60 years, you're going to lose some paperwork. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, that's not unheard of, right? Mm -hmm. So that is my report on the Somerton Man. Yeah. Or the Tallman Shook case. Any theories? <laughs> that wasn't a theory. That was a hiccup. That was a terrible theory, Justin. It wasn't a theory, though. That's the thing. All right. So, do you have any any theories on who he might have been? Not particularly. Most that anyone can kind of make as it sort of sits are assumptions from just how he looked, the couple of points that they went into... As it sort of sits, there wasn't anything immediately concrete that sort of ran through no. anything. It kind of seemed a little bit of grasping at straws to try and figure out who this was. I definitely admire their dedication to try and figure out all the stuff and all they went through to try and figure out who this man was. It's like whether he was like American or someone from New Zealand or something or someone from... But England, if there's know. nothing with anything within his wallet or any of those... He didn't have a wallet on him. No, nah, nothing like that or any sort of other information from there. It leads me to think of either A, someone pickpocketed the wallet off of him before the body was sort of found by police and whatnot, or he disposed of it and got rid of it of his own accord. And either destroyed it in any sort of way or put it somewhere where no one thought to look. Okay. So, I guess my next question would be, 
do you think... So there, there are two main theories. Is One is that he committed suicide. Hmm. And the other is that he was murdered. Do you lean to work more, like one of those more than the other? I think as it sits with me, it would probably be more around the lines of suicide for the most okay. bit. There is nothing within the reports of what they saw with him that sort of leads me to believe that he was murdered by anything. Because on the one hand, it might have been something he did himself, not with any sort of stuff, but you'd be surprised how powerful the brain can be with a person. Yeah, no, for sure. Those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. The only other thought that I had was he used a poison from an animal or something like that that caused the mild effects that were there or something enough that there were effects if you caught it soon enough, but they deteriorated after the body sort of passed. That's possible. Uh, Yeah, I'd say... Probably suicide would have been really very much likely. So here's my question and why. I don't know where I come down on this one. Okay. For me, it's still a toss-up because suicide makes a certain amount of sense. Mm. The part I have a hard time reconciling is the piece of paper now, that they found know? in his pants mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that said Tom and should, which translates to ended or finished. Mm-hmm. And the fact that that book was then found in a car wheel, uh, uh, by a car, at the beach. Mm. To me, there's something about that that just, like, why would you do that if you're going to commit suicide? Did they determine who was the person that sort of had the book or who the vehicle was owned by? Uh, I don't believe they released the name of the person who owned the vehicle. And the... Owner of the book, I believe, is unknown as well. It was picked up by another gentleman who turned it into the police later, Mm. but it's never been proven that he owned it prior. Because the only other thing I can think of is it probably wasn't that much of a tradition, but you occasionally find books like that anywhere. It might have been the case that he either A, found the book, read through it, got a supposed idea about it, took the last little piece of the page sort of as a keepsake from it and just took the book and left it somewhere. The fact that it was found within the car either was a decent coincidence or it was somewhere nearby and someone just picked it up from there. Yeah, I mean, that's entirely possible. So the other thing that makes it hard Mm. for me to believe suicide, and I fully admit that this might not be uh, an entirely convincing argument, is that... A, he didn't have a wallet or any ID with him. Yeah. And mm. two, the when they did the autopsy, they noted things like he was in really good shape for his age, and the calf muscles were those of either a dancer or a mid-to-long-range runner. Mm. And there's something like, I don't know, I guess because just the way my mind works, considering the time period, I tend to lean more towards the spy theory. I guess that's an option with how it was around those times. Like a spy that um, they disposed of, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's possible. The only other thing is with those particular professions of being either a runner or a dancer, that aside from being very physically demanding, they can sometimes be very mentally demanding. This is true. So... Yeah, no, I mean... Nobody knows. Exactly. So, There's nothing that gives it concrete enough evidence to sort of explain this sort of thing. But the other particular thing that I sort of thought about this is how many more cases do you think in the world are kind of like this? Tons. Dozens. Ton- oh, hundreds, probably. Probably, yeah. Yeah. This is just one that I read about and I was just fascinated by. Hmm. But... Yeah, so that is everything on, I have on the Summerton Man. Uh, do either of you have any last-minute thoughts or questions? I think the one particular thing that I have for a question is what was the thing that drew you to this topic to research on? And how did it sort of... you? How were you sort of introduced to it and ha- had the entrance of discovering more about it? So uh, I was initially introduced to it uh, through... A podcast 
no. uh, the, where they were discussing like urban legends and unsolved mysteries. This was one of the ones that came up. Uh, and then from there, I just ended up reading more about it, and I just found it fascinating. Mm. Um, especially like little things like the little piece of paper in his pants that said Tom and should. No. All these little things just made it so much more interesting to me. I mean, there's a lot of evidence here and there of something that leads to pretty much nothing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. So, Justin, do you have any last-minute thoughts or questions? Hmm. Just debating how many other weird random theories about unsolved mysteries there are now. There, There is another theory that I'll quickly go over. Uh, the nurse who lived so close to the beach, mm. she had a son. Okay. okay. Uh, his name was Robin. And they did a study on Robin's ear and the Somerton man's ear. And the shape of your ear is actually a good indicator of uh, familial links. And um, it's, it's very unique. No. And there okay. are certain ear formations that are noticed in families that are like genetically passed on mm. they had very similar ears okay hmm which can be either very coincidental or it yeah could it, it be it's a something connection. like less than half a percent of the population would have that ear yeah shape. Hmm. so there could statistically have been the chances there, are they maybe. were related hmm. maybe yeah well we're talking less than half a percent i mean hmm. anyway so, Justin, have you decided on a topic for next week? I have not. Alrighty. Well, I guess I'll have to tune in next week to find out what Justin's going to talk about. It's going to be some anime nonsense. I just know it. Oh, who knows? There are know. dozens of different topics that you can hit in that sort of case. I've honestly been tossing my brain around about my supposed one, but haven't done any sort of research into anything yet. I've already started on my next one. Anyway. Cool. Um, if you want to leave a comment and suggest a topic, by all means. Uh, other than that, remember to like the video, subscribe. Uh, there's a bunch of new stuff coming out very soon. And to wrap everything up, I'm Paul. I'm Dave. And Justin.